So as I say, our passage today is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll come to some of those verses in a moment and why, but truth is, I've, I've taken a bit of a journey this week to get here, and to get to, not here, but to get here, you, you know what I mean, to get to the thought and the conviction I have for this morning. Because you ever have that experience where People need to hear the words of the truth that are in the gospel. You share it with them, and it appears, and we we never know, do we? But it appears to have little or no impact. Things that we think, we hear and we think, that is amazing. That is incredible. God's love, God's grace, God's gifts, God's promise, God's assurance. And we go, that is amazing. And it warms our heart. And we tell other people and they go, eh. And it's like water off a duck's back. You ever had that? Yeah? And I got to thinking about this and it led me to a verse in this chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, and it's a chapter that has some amazing verses in it they are particularly relevant i think to the church at the moment because we've had some very high profile very public uh i don't know scandal too strong a word i don't know if it is or not but certainly moments of notoriety within the wider church here in the uk recently have we which which people have jumped on with enthusiasm and I just I was reading through this chapter because I was going to it for a specific verse which we'll come to later but as I was reading through it I just thought wow this is incredible for example verse one having this ministry by the mercy of God we do not lose heart amen yeah I wish I could say that that's always been the case though because sometimes I have if I'm really honest with you, and you know, we're in church, so perhaps honesty is a good thing. I mean, honesty is a good thing anywhere, but you know what I mean. Um, there have been times when I have lost heart. When I've seen people who make a mockery of the truth and undermine the power of God in the lives of those who need to hear him. And you kind of go, how does this manage to grab people's attention when the truth doesn't? The fact that we see people who can't see the promise of God and can't grab hold of the promise of God for their lives and seem to be on a a, a sort of spiral of self-destruction. And sometimes, sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes in serving God, I don't know, I'm saying this, maybe it's just me, sometimes we do kind of feel, what is the point? Came across a great song recently and, and it's, I mean, it starts that premise. Somebody was on the line. They were on hold to an insurance company or something. And like, interminably long, gradually, as that music plays, and then stops and you think, oh, uh, thank you for your call. Your call is important to us. Please hold. We'll be with you as soon as possible. And you hear that cycle for the 9,999th time and you're losing the will to live and you think to yourself, what is the point? Somebody was doing that and they wrote a song, what is the point? And the truth is, the point is this, we have the ministry that we have, we have the calling that we have, we have the opportunity that we have by the grace and the mercy of God. That is the point. And even though sometimes it's a struggle and even so sometimes people do things to make us despair and even though sometimes the world kind of comes against us and we think I would lose heart, actually we need to remind ourselves of that. We are not in this world to have an easy life. That didn't get many amens. We are not in this world to have an easy life. We are in this world by the mercy of God to serve him. And so in serving him, because we serve a higher purpose, we do not lose heart but we persevere. Amen. And then there's verse 2. Right? We have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And I read that and I thought, 
You know those church leaders, those preachers, those speakers, those TV evangelists, those people who put themselves out there and play fast and loose with behavior, fast and loose with the truth of God, take the word of God and twist it and tamper with it and, and meld it to make what they wanted to say so that they might promote and they might develop their ministry and develop their income stream. Leaders who think the rules don't apply to themselves, teachers who think they can be clever with the words to make it say what it doesn't. How can they do that when Paul writes a verse like that? We refuse to practice cunning. Sometimes, sometimes in church, in church ministries, you get these sort of manipulative practices that Take the music to create an atmosphere. Now, sometimes it's about allowing people to come in the presence of God, but sometimes it's done to manipulate and to, you know, sometimes. We need to be able to discern the difference and we need to know which is righteous and which isn't. We refuse. We renounce disgraceful, underhanded behaviors. Amen? We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. And where we find those that do, we should not heed them. But we should, by the open statement of the truth, commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. And that's not just in terms of dealing with the Bible, but that's in dealing with life. We refuse to practice cunning. We refuse to make it say what it doesn't say, to twist it, to accommodate our preferences. We stand true according to what? The Bible says that is the measure against us. The measure against my life is not your life. And thanks be to God for you, the measure against your life is not my life. The measure of our life is the word of God. Yeah? Verse 7. Verse 7. 6 and 7. For God who said, let this light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. What does that mean? It means that the glory is God's. We are just jars of clay. You know, earthen pots. And you know, they used to put treasure into earthen pots and then they would seal them. And do you know how they got the treasure out? They would break it. You're absolutely right. They would crack it open. And so if we are serving God and we are letting the reality of God flow out of us into the world around us, you know what that makes us, don't you? Crackpots. I thank you. The old jokes are really are the best. Right. But for those who think that they are something special, for those who believe their own PR, for those who stand up and serve God and somehow thinks that that gives them, you know, license to be what the Bible says they shouldn't be. Hey, this is Paul writing this, so if it applies to him, it definitely applies to him. If Paul was a jar of clay, you know, I'll be honest with you, I think I'm just maybe a pile of mud over in the corner. Yes, are you with me on this? And there are so many people who, because they are in church ministry, because they are in leadership, because they are in a, you know, they've got a TV station or whatever, there are so many people who kind of think that they are somehow something special. We are all something special, but we are something special because of the grace of God, and we are something special because of the light of Jesus that shines within us, and that light shines out of us, and it is actually very little to do with us. It is to do with him. And I sometimes wish that some of the stuff that's on social media, people will start to realize, hey, it's not about us. It's about him. Let him shine out of us. And then you've got verses 8 to 11. I mean, this is, a, this is a great chapter. Can I encourage you to read 2 Corinthians 4? It is an amazing chapter. 
We are afflicted. I mean, this is good, positive upbuilding stuff for a Sunday morning, isn't it? We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now, we haven't got time to unpack all of that this morning, but fundamentally what it's saying is, look, there is a spiritual message there that is about us surrendering ourselves and dying to self so that he might be glorified. But there was also, when Paul was writing this, there was also a very real world application in that they were being crushed. Uh, they were being afflicted rather, they were being perplexed, they were being pers persecuted, they were facing death perpetually. And I read that and I go, can someone please tell me again how being a Christian means I will automatically have an easy life and be wealthy? Yeah? Yeah? Because there are plenty of preachers out there and there are plenty of books that have been written that out there that will tell you that that is the case. But actually, we refuse to tamper with God's word and God's word says, doesn't always work like that. Say amen. If you agree, talk to me later. If you don't, that's fine. But you see, the reality, this is the promise, verses 16 and 17. We do not lose heart. Why? Because although outwardly we are wasting away, say amen if you know that. Amen. <laughs> Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles. Do you feel your troubles are light and momentary? Do you feel your troubles are light? I have yet to meet anybody who feel that their troubles are light. Because when your troubles are your troubles, they may, they may be a mole howl. A mole howl? What's a mole howl when it's at home? They may be a mole hill in comparison to someone else's mountain, but they're still my mole hill. And it's still spoiling me lawn. Yeah? But Paul says, our light and moment... Remember persecuted, afflicted, etc., 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 are moment, light and momentary troubles. Why does he say that? Because in the scheme of all eternity, when we've been there 10,000 years, our molehills will seem quite insignificant. Amen? No matter how big they feel now, the reality is in the great scheme of God's plan for our lives, they are but grass of the field that is here today and gone tomorrow. Or maybe next week, or maybe 10 years' time, or maybe at the end of my life. But compared to eternity. Yes? And are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Amen? Amen? I mean, these are words of truth, and it is only by embracing this reality and stepping away from the pretense that we actually have a message to bring. But that was kind of like sideline to why I went to this chapter. Because I went to this chapter for verse 4. Why is it that people can hear the message of truth, the hope that is in Jesus, the comfort that is available to them. And although they can be really nice about it and really warm and really friendly and really engaging in their conversation, and their, they cannot see it. They cannot grasp it. They cannot take hold of it. Why is it? Well, Paul answers that in verse 4. He says, this is the world in which we live. That the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Why is it that people find it so hard to see? I was talking to Linda about this this week, and she was remembering when she was a, a teenager going along to, to Christian coffee bars and coffee evenings and so on, and going along and hearing 
you know, this was Northern Ireland in the, well, I better not tell you what decade, but it was Northern Ireland anyway. And, you know, they, they were very forthright in their preaching. That you must be born again was a message that was crystal clear. There was no escaping it. And she knew it, she heard it, she knew it, she knew it. But it just washed over and washed over and washed over until it came to a point one night where suddenly it clicked and made sense. Why is that? Why does that happen? Because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. Because there is a spiritual reality going on in the world in which we live. There's a spiritual warfare going on in the world in which we live, where people, those people that we love, that we can't understand, why can they not see what we see? Why can they not grasp what they, why can they not grasp what we grasp? Now, it may be that they have seen it and chosen no. And people are allowed to do that. Jesus allowed people to walk away from him. But it is also the case that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. And how do we deal with that? Because we've all experienced it. We tell the open statement of truth, and it is like water off a duck's back. Whilst at the same time, and this is what frustrates me sometimes, at the same time, those same people will grab hold of the false message that is around Christianity, or the scandal that is around Christianity, and that message penetrates them with such conviction that they will rail against us about it. Why can they not see the truth, but they can embrace the falsehood? Why can they not see the positive, but they can get so excited about the negative? Well, in truth, that's because we all like to feel that we're not the worst person in the room, don't we? And if we hear that some Christian leader has done something wrong, it does kind of make us feel a little bit better about our own shortcomings. Yes? Just me then. Okay. And again, this week, I was in a place, and I walked away from that place, and I thought, why can't they see this? After all, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 says, Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bring procla- uh, to, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Listen, if the God, the prince of this world, the God of this world has blinded their eyes to the truth, uh, but Jesus came with a message that actually brings sight to the blind, why can't they see? What do I need to do in order for them to be able to see that truth? Strangely enough, it's not through fancy programs or initiatives, although both programs and initiatives have their place. And if they create an opportunity to engage with people who would normally come to church, I'm all in favor of it. We are currently looking at the possibility, and it is still a possibility. It might not happen, but we are ex- actively exploring it. There's a, a thing that started running called um, a grief course that started running that is based on scripture, but is actually broad-based for people who are struggling with grief. And a lot of people struggling with grief at the moment. Are. We're actively looking at whether we can run that in the new year in our church as an opportunity to serve our community. As I say, looking into it at the moment, your prayers over that would be appreciated. But So there's nothing wrong with initiatives and there's nothing wrong with programs. But they in themselves are not the answer. Because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. So how will they see truth if the God of this world has blinded their eyes? Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, come as a consequence of Jesus being led of the Spirit, going into the wilderness, spending time in the Father's presence, and then coming back and saying this. Led of the Spirit, he spent time in the Father's presence and came back saying, I have, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and I have a message that brings sight to the blind. It is the Holy Spirit who opens the eyes. It is the Holy Spirit that breaks the chains. It is the Holy Spirit that brings light and life. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin and convinces 
of truth. It's not me and it's not you. He may use our lives as example. He may use our words as conduits. He may use our acts of kindness as means to provoke. But it is, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. And that's why, says Jesus, I've got a message that can bring sight to the blind. And if, the cha- if those around us are to have their eyes open, their chains broken, their liberty found, his work in us and them, on us and to them, is what we need. If those that we love are to have their eyes opened, if the God of this world's hold that blinds their eyes to the truth is to be broken, then we need to be actively walking in the power and the reality and the truth of the Holy Spirit. We need to be spending time in God's presence. We need to be intentionally seeking to move in His Spirit, praying that He will open their eyes. And as those two things come together, so illumination can be brought. Because you see, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this age has blinded their eyes. They are being prevented from seeing. And we have the tools and the opportunity to give them the chance to change it. We do. And in another letter that Paul wrote, he wrote of the tools, the weapons, the the opportunity we have to bring a difference if we will carry these things in our life. It's in Ephesians chapter 6, and it's verse 17 and 18. Every day we go out into the world, take the helmets off it. Look, when you go out into the world, cover your life with the reality of your salvation, won't you? Put on the helmet of salvation. Cover the reality of your life with the fact that you are saved and redeemed and forgiven and renewed in Jesus. Amen? Take hold of that. But then, take with you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, etc., etc., etc. Notice the two things that Paul says there. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Take and pray at all times in the Spirit. What is the common denominator there? The Spirit. The Spirit. Pray at all times in the Spirit and carry the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. As, be intentional about it when we go out into our day. Be intentional about it when we go out into our lives. It is so easy to lose heart, friends. It is so easy to become jaded. It is so easy to become familiar with this reality I mean it is isn't it really easy to become familiar that people that we love cannot see the truth of eternal life in Jesus isn't it really it is isn't it and it should actually it should drive us to our knees it should break our heart if we really love them the fact that they are facing the prospect of a lost eternity should drive us to our knees to pray that the God of this world will be stopped in his impact on them and that they will see the truth. Shouldn't it? So do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. But seek that the Spirit of the Lord might be upon you and that he might open eyes that have been blinded. Verse 18. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions. That is how we make a difference. And I was brought to that this week because, as I said, I was in a situation where we openly shared the word of faith, openly shared the word of truth, And as nice as the people were, it seemed to have little impact. Now, we don't know. But it just challenged me. 
about how we, as people who believe in the power of the Spirit for this modern age, how we are taking the sword of the Spirit and praying in the Spirit and carrying it into the reality, the spiritual reality that's affecting those that we love. Lord, help us not to lose heart, but also help us not to be complacent in the truth that the power of your Spirit is able to open the eyes that have been made blind. And grant that in every element of our lives we live the reality of seeking your Spirit in our day, in us, and on those around us. Amen.